Today we have Margaret Fox, former restaurateur and culinary director of Harvest Market in the studio with us today. Hello Margaret, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Now I understand this is not your first experience with TV. I can't tell a lie. I was on the Howdy Doody show. Yes, I was nine. That was my debut. Your debut? Mm -hmm. So how did you arrive in Mendocino? And when was that? That was a long, long time ago in a land far, far away. It was actually 1975. Okay. And I got here kind of circuitously because I didn't want to go to graduate school, I realized, in my last year of college. And I thought I would go and work at a friend's cooking school in the Napa Valley. And everything was great until I called up to get the details. And I was told, oh, no, that wasn't an option. And they didn't need me. And I burst into tears, and I didn't know what to do. And my dad said very calmly, well, why don't you go to Mendocino? There's a bakery there, and you love to bake. And I thought, oh, OK. And I'd never been here before. So I, uh, I came up with a friend and wound up in the town, went to a place called the Bank House, which also doesn't exist anymore, and asked the guy, are there any jobs in town? And he said, can you sew? And I said, oh, no. And he said, well, can you bake? And I said, well, yeah, I sort of brightened up. And he said, because the hotel is looking for a baker. So I went there, and I oohed not over the professional equipment. No, none of the things did I know how to use, however. And I was hired with no interview. <laughs> and on the spot. And on the spot. And I thought, whoa, this is kind of exciting. And I got a place to live at the Mendocino Arts Center through a fluke. Bill Zaka put it, sort of put a kind word in for me. Right. And I zoomed back to the Bay Area, went to a couple of bakeries to learn how to bake really quickly with bakers who thought this was very, very funny that I was going to learn how to do this in two sessions. And I came back to Mendocino and, and started at the hotel. And how long were you at the hotel? I was there for about nine months. Okay. And I got really tired of doing the same thing all the time. I made little tart tops and many different kinds of breads. And they were sort of interested in me doing the same thing all the time. So after a while, I was a little bit of been there, done that. But that was good. And then what did you do after? I went to the um, cheese shop, also a business that doesn't exist anymore. Okay. It was in, uh, it was in the, what building is it now? David Jones's. Oh, no, no. It's in the Mendocino Market. That's where that was, across from the post office. Oh, OK. Yeah. And I was, uh, Carla Jupiter and I were the only employees. She's a longtime local as well. And we just worked and learned about cheese. And I baked and, and sold my things there, mm -hmm. uh, my only venue. It was really fun. And yeah, I was there for about six months. And then the Beaujolais came up for sale. And I bought it with three other people. Once again, something I was completely unprepared for. <laughs> the rest is history. The rest is say. history. Yeah, my mom burst into tears uh -huh. when I told her that I had done this. Right. And my grandmother said, oh, no, the only business your grandfather and I were unsuccessful at was the restaurant business. So many dishes. That's what she said, so many dishes. <laughs> so it was a, a sort of a, um, a, a little bit of an unsure beginning. And then it was really unsure once I got started. So, so Café Beaujolais gave you an opportunity, obviously, to yeah. create your own restaurant. How difficult a process was that? It was impossible. <laughs> I never should have, should have made it in that business. I mean, I had every single thing against me when you read the classic articles about why restaurants fail. Uh -huh. you, know, you could go down the list going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. not enough money, no experience. I had no experience. We didn't even go out to that many restaurants when I was a kid. It just sort of wasn't done the way it is now, you know? Right. And so I, and I'd never really cooked on that kind of a large scale. I liked doing little parties and things like that. But it was just a complete fantasy come to life. So, you so know, again, you were on the spot and you learned. Yeah, while I was in the, while you in the thick of it, yeah. And in the end, you had the privilege of serving somebody like Julia Child. Yes, I know. All kinds of famous people, actually. Oh, really? Walked Did through. Yes. Yeah. Robert Redford was a, was a real fan of the restaurant. He came, once he found out that we would protect his privacy when he was there, mm -hmm. he came several times. And, so if I may ask you to talk a little bit about Julia's visit, was this a surprise to you? Happily, no. That could have been really <laughs> shocking. <laughs> I, 
had a couple of days' notice, just enough to get a little mildly hysterical mm -hmm. over the whole thing. Right. And to do a lot of cooking in anticipation of her visit. I sort of pulled out the stops and did all, you know, a bunch of French stuff and quiche and all this sort of, sort of fancier things than maybe we normally had for lunch. And then, lo and behold, she ordered our black bean chili, which was the, the homeliest dish on the entire menu, not to mention the least expensive. Okay. I literally couldn't believe it when the order came in. <laughs> black bean chili? Are you kidding? And so, subsequently, what happened to you <laughs> afterwards? Well, of course, everybody, everybody in town wanted to know what Julia had ordered. Of course. And then I said, the black bean chili, and that's what everybody ordered for the next two months. We made it three times a week. <laughs> we could not make enough black bean chili to satisfy all the people who wanted to eat exactly what Julia had eaten. Yeah, I, I was a little chagrined because I had hoped, you know, that something a little bit fancier might be picked, but that was what she wanted. And, you know, that's very Julia, very down to earth. You know, she didn't go for the la di da sort of. No, she never struck as a no. pretentious person. No, at not all. at all. She just, you know, it seemed earthy, it seemed good, and it, it was a really delicious dish. That's in my cookbook, too, as a matter of fact. But it, she just, you know, that's what she went for, and, I got, and she loved it. I got a big kick out of it, really. It was good. I bet. But Beaujolais did some interesting, unique things. Um, it's it's a farmer's markets are very popular now and the farm to table right. movement, but in the 70s and the 80s, etc., that was probably not as well oh. known. But no, it wasn't so, wasn't so common. We, we actually hosted for two years the farmer's market when it first started in Mendocino, right on the grounds of the, of the restaurant, which was, I mean, we just really believed in in all of the all of the farm to table stuff that's so touted these days, we just kind of right. like the so idea. So you grew that a lot was, of your vegetables and the herbs that you used in your. Well, we didn't. We started out actually, but that's a big project. That's a, that's a real money loser. We learned that fast, but we loved to go. We had a couple of people in Comchi who were growing little baby beans for us and just and people would come to the back door knowing that we loved this kind of stuff. So you're. Tenure at Beaujolais came to an end. You mm -hmm. decided to, to move on to new things. Right. What, other, what, what did you do after Beaujolais? I did business consulting. Okay. And I, it turned out, through no intention on my part, that I wound up working with all women who all had small businesses, and many of them were artists. So this brings us now to your current position as the culinary director of Harvest Market. How did that arrive? Well, that sort of came from out of the blue. Tom Honer, the owner of Harvest, contacted me and, and invited me in for an interview. And he had invented this position. It wasn't occupied by anybody previous to me. And what's some of the things that have you found quite exciting about your tenure at Harvest? Of made from scratch products and introducing some um, organic things. We did a lot of, of uh, business with Covalo Farms last summer kind of to, to the chagrin of the deli manager who kept saying, another flat of tomatoes. I was like, but they're organic and they're fantastic. The viewers can still, I think, have a little bit of the experience of Margaret Fox and Café Beaujolais, if you don't mind, if I show people this book here. And would you like to tell us just a little bit about your book? Yeah, this book, well, this book is really interesting because I got to write it twice. Uh, the first time I wrote it was, I can't even remember, it came out in 1990, and I wasn't really that happy with it, but I thought, oh well. And then Ten Speed came to me and said, would you like to do it over again? And I said, well, yeah, that would be, I really would like to do it. And so I spent one or two frantic months rewriting that book, and I actually did it completely over. Old recipes with oat bran went by the wayside because I decided that was just very passe. And some really rich recipes went by the wayside too because we're sort of not eating like that these days. Mm -hmm. And I introduced some new recipes, lots of new copy. So Margaret, you have written three books, I believe. Well, I, I helped Chris Kump write Evening Food. Yeah. Okay, so you've been associated with yeah, three yeah, yeah. books. 
Uh, is there a fourth in the works? Ooh, not that I know of. I might do some, um, some writing that would be on the web, but I don't know if I'll actually do it again. It's the most gigantic project. And when you write a food book, you're cooking all day long. And you know, the, pro the problem that no one ever realizes is what do you do with all that food? Yes. There's a huge amount of food that's left every single time you make something, whether it's successful Does or not. Does your circle of friends increase when they know that you're cooking, yeah, yeah. doing your test kitchen? <laughs> well, I used to, I used to make, make a dish, go, oh, God, 39 muffins. What am I going to do with these? And then I would rush it into town to various businesses that I knew and would say, you know, would you like some of these muffins? And the first few times, everybody was very excited. And then they're a little bit less excited as time goes on. So, yeah. I know it's hard to believe. It sounds really fun, but like anything, it becomes work after a while. Do you still keep your hand into cooking, or do you just sort of do it more? I know that Harvest has um, you introduce some cooking demonstrations or cooking classes. Right. Are those? Do you do you teach in those yourself, or do, or do you have outside people come? Actually, I I did the first one, but now I'm an ass assistant. And so I'll assist anybody who, who needs help. And we're, we're going to be starting those again soon. Yeah, they're demos. They're very fun. An hour, you know, no big, big, complicated thing. And people get to show what they can do, and everybody loves it. Well, thank you, Margaret. It's been very entertaining, very knowledgeable, and a pleasure to sit down and learn a little bit about the world of Margaret Fox <laughs> and your contribution to the culinary Feast of Mendocino. <laughs> Thank so you. Much. Thanks for having me. Pleasure.